around anywhere in London and see similar things but when you pass the Undercroft the colours the shapes and the people it's such a variety of things you can see in such a small space and that you wouldn't get anywhere else in London. My favourite bit of the Undercroft is the banks and there's just something amazing about the idea of riding up onto an angled bank and feeling the incline of the surface change and feeling your body move at speed. And what goes on here is unique and that adds a huge amount of character, like this place has got so much character, charisma, whatever you want to call it, it's got it. It's always been an inspiring place since the 60s and 70s when people first started to discover it. It's definitely shaped and changed the perspective of the South Bank. To have something like this for young people in central London is really rare, you know. Uh, you know, most places are closing and and I think if it does get relocated, it won't have the same kind of a, a impact as what it is. Lo notas que tiene vida, que ha estado tiempo, que la gente lo conoce, y es como que eso te trae vibraciones. Hay skate parks muy buenos, muy bonitos en España, pero no tienen esta vida que lo ves y además que está en el corazón de la ciudad. It's the epicenter of a culture that has created a huge amount of good. Uh, especially creatively in, 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 our, in, in the UK and, and abroad. It's this place of, that, that this culture has lived for 40 years, you know, and, and that shouldn't be underestimated. So you could put shops and retail under the Hungerford Bridge, but but it's more expensive to build units there. Whereas at the Undercroft, you've got a pre-existing architecture and you can just effectively seal up the facade. So it's cheaper to do it, so you generate more money. And that, in a way, that's the problem. That it's the prime location that can be, is the cheapest place to put in new units that can generate the most money. And that just happens to be the spot that the skateboarders have used for 40 odd years. The brutalist architecture of the South Bank Centre is, is fundamental to the character of the Undercroft. And it's characterised in particular by a very um, overt use of raw concrete. So if you go into the Undercroft, you see this very curious thing. It's mainly concrete, columns and walls, a lot of which has been shuttered, which means that when concrete is cast in situ, it's put into wooden forms and it's deliberately made at the Undercroft that if you look at the concrete, you can see the texture of the wood that's used the shuttering. So when the shuttering's taken away, you get the pattern of the wood on the, on the concrete. So you get color and movement from the skating and the street art and the BMX against this kind of gray, solid, monumental architecture. This spot is very, um, it has a kind of attraction. First time I, I walk here, I was thinking, I, ha I must do something here, I must do something in the skate park. 
because it has like a good vibes. The thing that I like is like it's kind of confusing, like boxes. You see boxes everywhere, paintings. If you don't want to paint uh, directly on the wall, then you've got like these kind of like urban slants in the structure and the pillars and all the rest of it that kind of help us as graffiti writers to kind of try and stretch our um, kind of skill set, I guess, and try and, and, you know, when you're spraying up on a slant, you're kind of developing uh, how you can, um, you know, put a mural down, I guess. Through the eyes of a skateboarder, the whole city becomes a concrete playground. Everything you see in the city can be skated. It's a matter of figuring out how you can do that. And when you see other people doing that, and in such a space as South Bank, where it's kind of condensed, all these people meet in what's essentially quite a small space. With skating, for example, you'll see, you'll see skaters skating around, you'll do your tricks, you'll see other people doing tricks. You might come here and see something you never would have expected was possible here. Um, South Bank's definitely one of the sort of key influential sort of free open spaces in, in the country, I feel, still now. It's probably the longest ongoing one um, compared to other spaces that are still there, but like are not as frequented as South Bank. South Bank is frequented like every single day of the year, you know, and night, I'm sure. But I think it's very important for, to have places where you can just come and express yourself and, and do what you want to do rather than having to just be put in a box your whole life. There's not free spaces where you can just come and do what you want to do and nowhere with the aesthetics or the atmosphere of this place. My name is Mark Vallet, I'm a documentary photographer. I've been a photographer for 20 years and I've been documenting youth culture over that time. And in the last few years, I've been particularly interested in anti-skateboarding devices. Um, and, uh, sorry about this. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Hello. I know it's, well that's, that's why we're here, because this is um, a very famous form of skateboarding spot. And uh, this documentary, these guys, can, can I just finish and then you can say what you need to say? Just want to let you know. I mean, it's worth, it's no harm in that, is there? So these guys, uh, university students, they're making a documentary about this spot and the history of skateboarding and also how this space has been changed. As, uh, you know, how Shell, the owners, have stopped skateboarding. So in a way, you turning up just right now is kind of part of that process. And, you know, about what is what we can do in the private or public realm or the semi-public realm, because in a way, this used to be very public realm that we were allowed to be involved in. And now that's changed over the last few years. And, you know, physically you coming along and saying you can't do pictures, or if somebody was skateboarding, they couldn't skate. So I suppose the question is, when, where, does, where does the public bit start? So after the steps. So once we're down on there, we're not your problem. Okay. All right then. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. So to start off again. I mean, over the last uh, two or three years, I got particularly interested in uh, how pr public spaces have been privatised, and the idea that the you know the public realm is shrinking, and. Uh, as an old skateboarder and someone who's photographed skateboarding, um, I've always been aware of anti-skateboarding devices. So for a number of years now, I've quite obsessively been photographing these little metal devices added on to particular areas and bits and bits of architecture to try and uh, control what people can and can't do in a particular place. I mean, for example, um, City of London headquarters 
All that land is owned by a company called Moore London. Incidentally, it's just been sold off in one of the biggest land deals in British history to a Kuwaiti sovereign uh, investment fund. And so the bottom line is all that land, which was public once, where the seat of London democracy sits, is uh, effectively been privatised and now is controlled by a uh, you know, private company. There's another legal spot around the corner, you've got Leak Street. But um, for me personally, I prefer it, it's best to be among you know, other people practising different skills. And also, Leak Street is very enclosed and it's not good for you to be enclosed in a tunnel all day and be using the spray. Um, although, you know, you use a mask, it's, it's not a nice vibe down in that tunnel. It kind of feels like you've been isolated to a certain area and, and, and that's where your place is. But here you can integrate with, like, the general public and, and other skaters. That's why it's been a, uh, such a successful breeding ground of creative culture, because you haven't had any hassle. And a lot of people think that you know, young people congregating in an area doing skateboarding or BMX or graffiti is a, is a bad thing. And, it encur you know, they think it, it encourages vandalism and antisocial behaviour, whereas actually I believe it's very much the opposite. I believe that if you give young people the space to do what they want, then they will create something brilliant and they'll do something very creative and positive. And I think that's all South Bank was. Like, I've never been trained, I never went to film school, I never learnt any of the sort of film school uh, techniques. I didn't really learn how to do things properly. I just made skate films and I didn't realise at the time how valuable that was that I was, um, you know, shooting, editing, producing, directing, distributing, like doing everything on my own at like 23 or something. And that's really valuable. And, and as I've got my career's progressed and sort of 10 years later and I'm making feature films and that, it's all the same. It's the same mentality, it's the same sort of, that sort of can-do attitude of, of skateboarders is, is what's kept me going in my career, I think, and it's, it's so positive and I, um, I think anyone who just goes out and makes stuff uh, will find their career slightly easier because they've just gone and done it and I think that's the attitude that skateboarding instils in you is an attitude of, well, you just got to go and do it because it's there. Skateboarders are incredibly interested in architecture, but they don't value uh, who the architect is, and that's good. So, for example, at the South Bank Centre, the bit of the architecture that the skateboarders love is not the grand auditorium or the grand galleries or the amazing brutalist style and the complexity with which the concrete is formed. What they love is that weird space at the bottom with the funny banks that everyone else had ignored. Like we're here at the Dalston Curve Garden, um, and this space has been around for the last sort of like sort of six or seven years or so. Um, and it was created by people, you know, people sort of took it upon themselves to sort of make this space what it is now. It's just a completely like um, bushy area that was just neglected and left and corners off. And, um, and, and people have invested their time and, and physical efforts in making the place what it is now, which is probably one of the only community spaces left in Dalston but this is kind of like the only real green space free space where people can just come and just be and South Bank you know is is one of those spaces but it's a concrete jungle but it's an underground it's an undercover open free space. I think 91 when they then tried to get rid of us physically by putting up bars putting stones and things like that out Again, it was kind of like, there wasn't really an official campaign as such. It was just skaters and BMXers responding to what the South Bank did. And this is why the Save South Bank, you know, the issue to save the Undercroft is so important because it's another one of those spaces. But, um, but it's one of the longest ongoing spaces that's been used by people over the years who've made it what it is now. interesting about the, you know, the undercroft is that it was um, a space that was discovered, reinterpreted 
and took many years for skaters, you know, to cement that it was theirs. And, uh, you know, the fight to defend it by the Long Live South campaign has been an incredibly creative, inspirational fight of showing, you know, all of that and showing how important it is to keep these spaces. Well, the campaign's got one aim, and that's to save this space. We just want to keep it safe forever for future generations to enjoy and for so more, more amazing things can happen here. It's not just about skateboarding. We've been saying that all along, like South Bank Centre want to put us into a box like with just a couple of dozen skateboarders. That's far from the case and that shouldn't be the view by anyone because it's just not true. Uh, it's really been a campaign of, of such a diversity of people of all backgrounds. Since then we have had uh, 100, over 130,000 people sign for the preservation of the skate area here. We've also uh, managed to uh, hand over a record number of planning objections, uh, over 33,000 planning objections, which means it's the most unpopular planning application in UK history. Now it looks kind of uh, on the right course. We, haven't, we still haven't got any um, legal uh, protection for it, and that's our goal. Uh, until we haven't got any legal protection for this space, we'll stay here and campaign. It's vitally important to keep the undercroft open and hopefully the campaign's going to be successful but once it's absolutely 100% guaranteed that it's being saved is that moment when we celebrate. The best chance to absolutely guarantee and secure skateboarding in the undercroft space is the application that's currently in with the High Courts to have it protected under the 2006 Commons Act to have it listed as a town or village green. Basically the village green legislation is there to preserve spaces where uh, lawful sports and pastimes have taken place for over 20 years. Now people have been skating here for 40 years so we figured that that's obviously the case. You know with so many people living in cities these days and there have been very little kind of green space around, pastimes like skateboarding have come up to make use of the urban environment so we think it's only right that this legislation um, can like, make this place become a village green. We think it's an important precedent that needs to be set with the way the city's going and the way that public spaces is going. You know, we need to protect what we have. Behind me going on today, we uh, have our one year anniversary jam to celebrate uh, one year of the campaign, one year of Long Live South Bank and the fact that we've kept it open so far. This campaign has just been a celebration of our culture and of the people and of the future generations who, who are going to come and use this space. We don't want it to turn into a protest because we've, we've been very careful for this not to be a protest. It's a celebration of culture. But if it's going to come to that, we know that we've tried everything we could have to, to not have to come to that. Yeah, we, we're just so grateful to all of all of the brands who've helped us out with product that we're able to like give the stuff away. You know? We had more product than we knew what to do with. You know, so but it was great because it meant that like pretty much every kid went home with something. And like, if there was a kid who needed a new board or whatever, we were like, there you go, hooked him up. So yeah, basically the fight goes on. Like, we've covered a lot of ground. We're in a really strong position, but we're not quite there yet. You know, it seems like every time we get close to sort of seeing this through, the South Bank Centre will sort of pull back and like elongate the process. But like, you know, we're getting there, you know, like we're knocking at their door. Heads will roll, you know, like there's too much, like, there's too much noise about this place. There are too many people that care about it. And, uh, and especially with Boris Johnson stepping in and giving his support, you know, it's like we're nearly there, but not, not yet. So it's a final push. Everyone be sure to follow the campaign, go to the website, share the stuff around, spread the word. We want everyone in the world to know about this place, you know, because if, if the people can save this place, you know, that it's made by the people, for the people, and like, won't be like given over to the corporations, you know, then we've got hope for the rest of the city.